Hello world, this is Lisa Fredrickson, your professor from Johnson County Community College. And in this short screencast, we're going to debrief on the exercises you do at the end of chapter one of our textbook to make sure we're on board with some of the key terminology. I have already produced two short screencasts on where to store your JavaScript. I encourage you to watch them because by watching them, you realize that JavaScript can go in basically three places. In the head section, which is the location for the modernizer external JS file. It can go inside the body section, anywhere inside script tags. And often we have a script tag right before the closing body tag that calls an external JavaScript that's going to help the user interact with that web page. So in these examples, we have JavaScript right in the middle of the body, and that's really a bad practice. We want to tear our JavaScript out and put it in an external file so that we can more easily maintain it and reuse it. But for convenience purposes, in this first chapter, the JavaScript is going directly in the body tags and these script tags so that we can just work with one file. In this example, the JavaScript we're writing is using the document.write method. Document is the object. The first and most common object you're working with is the document. That is the web page itself. The other object you're gonna work with in JavaScript 1 is the window object, and that is the browser window and we'll use the browser window to send messages to the user and to ask them to prompt them for input. But we're using the right method. A method is simply something that an object can do. And in this case, the document object can write HTML tags as well as content to the web page, an ordered list that's opening and closing, and four list items. And that JavaScript produces these four items on a web page. Now, if that were all your JavaScript were doing, it would be ridiculous to use JavaScript because we would just use these HTML tags and not write them with JavaScript. But this gives us an opportunity to practice with the script, close script tags, with the document object, with the right method, and to learn some syntax. And that is that a method is followed by the left and right parentheses. And then anything inside the parentheses that is literal, that you literally want the method to write, are enclosed in quotation marks. The book also makes the point that you can use apostrophes interchangeably with quotation marks. But if you have quotation marks, it's best to stick with quotation marks. Or if you use apostrophes, then stick with apostrophes. Just be consistent. The other thing I want to say about this very short example is that JavaScript is less forgiving in terms of white space than either HTML or CSS. It's really best that you keep each JavaScript statement on its own line, no matter how long. It's also best if you close each JavaScript statement with a semicolon, even though it's not required in certain cases. So this is a good practice for beginners especially. One JavaScript statement per line, close every line with a semicolon, that's exercise 1-1. One, one. Exercise 1-2 one, is almost exactly the same thing, only we have several little script, closed script tags with a single JavaScript statement in our web page. And this time we don't see the quotation marks surrounding our argument that we're trying to write because these are variable names and variable names are not surrounded by the quotation marks. They're not literal text and tags that we're inserting into the web page. In this case, the exercise shows us how to declare variables. And if we declare a text variable, we set it off with quotation marks. Again, you can use apostrophes, but just stay consistent. And if we're declaring a numeric variable, then we just enter the number. When we call that variable name in our script, we simply use the variable name. We do not set it off with literal quotation marks. So this exercise is simply showing us how to write a variable name. By the way, if you've never declared a variable, my recommendation on this equal sign is to say to yourself, assigned to or is set to. Use those phrases instead of is equal to or otherwise your old math algebra thinking will get in the way because this is not a teeter-totter like it was in algebra. It is an assignment statement. So the way I read this is declare a variable, name it service one name, and set it equal to the text basic. For this one, it would be declare a variable, name it service one speed, and set it equal to the number five. And that creates this web page with some text and some numbers in a table. The third little exercise has one little piece of JavaScript here on this submit button. I'll show you what it looks like. So there's a little bit of JavaScript that's on the on-click 
event of that button that creates this thanks for your order message. And here's what it looks like. Here's your JavaScript alert. And we know that's a method because we see the parentheses. We're inside of an attribute value. So on this attribute value, if I've already used my quotation marks to surround my value as I must in HTML, then I have nothing left in JavaScript except apostrophes. So that's why we're using the apostrophes here. If I use quotation marks, it wouldn't work because the attribute value would think it closed right there. The other thing that happened on this little exercise is that they use the alert method without an object. And in this case, we're talking to the browser. So we're talking to the window object. In the window.alert statement, window is implied or it is assumed. So you don't have to write window.alert. But to me, when I'm learning a new language, I like to use the entire statement. And also notice that even though that JavaScript is here in this on click event, it's a complete statement and we are ending it with a semicolon. Later on, we're going to take that JavaScript out so that our JavaScript is not intermixed with our HTML and we're going to trigger it on something called an event handler. But for now, that JavaScript is on this on-click event of this input button. Let's go to the fourth example. The fourth example shows you just how extensive you can get inside an on-click event. This on-click event has one, two, three, four statements. And notice they all start with document. Document is the web page itself. They're finding an element by its ID value. And they're using single apostrophes here because we're inside the quotation marks of the entire attribute value. And they're setting its value property to something special. So what this is doing, let's run this and then we can examine the code a little bit better. If I click home, it's setting those values for these input boxes. If I click work, it's setting those values for these input boxes. So this example introduces you to the document.getElementById method, which is very popular. We're going to get an element by ID and what's its ID value? Street input. If I look down here, I find that this input box is street input and it's going to set its dot value property to one main street. And that happens when I click these radio buttons. So this just simply teaches you that this on click event can have several JavaScript statements if desired. Again, this is not a really great place to put your JavaScript because it's all mashed up inside the HTML. So again, we're going to simplify this with function names. We're going to wrap these with function names and then run those functions from event handlers later. But for right now, I just wanna make sure you can read those statements and understand the logic of what's going on. Also notice the nice indentation and the one JavaScript statement per line, which is just gonna keep your life a lot more organized. The fifth exercise is simply to fix some syntax errors. Thank you.